Good morning and welcome to Morning Java, brought to you as always by our friends at the Get-Go Cafe and Market, where they are not only open for business, but they are selling seven-inch subs, Dale Lolly, for four ninety nine. dollars Yeah, and if, uh, you know, the Steelers uh, coming out of their draft think they can win uh, Super Bowl number seven, so it kind of matches up well. There you go. Well played. Well played. I not that one yet. It's as if you didn't spend the past several weeks completely immersed in that event and we're all exhausted from it today. Um, it, the, the draft is over. Um, I saw your grade on the site. Um, it's not going to be one that excites people, is it? You know what I mean? Like it's not going to have that, that wow factor to it. Yeah, and that's kind of the, uh, the, the tenor that I got as I went through all the comments and, and everything that were on the site yesterday. I really didn't have time to do it during the day you know, while the draft was going on, but I, I went back through all the comments and looked at er everything everybody was saying, and it happens every year. I mean, somebody's guy doesn't get picked, or they wanted this guy instead of that guy. We don't know. Um, you know, you could find rankings on these guys. You could find guys ranked a, a 100 or 175, and it, honestly, there's no difference because once you get past those first, you know, 25 players, everybody's guessing a lot of times, but yeah, I mean, when you when you look at this, the only guy who should make an immediate impact in year one is Chase Claypool. Um, if the other guys make an impact, uh, maybe maybe McFarland has some touchdown runs or something like that. We'll see. Uh, but the other guys were drafted for down the road, which is what the Steelers usually do. They don't go into a draft needing to address uh, you know a starter starting position or anything like that. And this year in particular, as I, I noted in my uh, final 10 thoughts today about this, I don't know that I'd want to be in that position going into this draft because of, of no OTAs, no mini camps, no, no, mm -hmm. none of that stuff's going to happen. These teams are going to have about 20 practices to get these uh, rookies ready to play in the NFL. And in a lot of cases, that's not going to be enough. One uh, crazy person on social media, and I know that can be redundant, uh, at one point noted – through the second round that it looked like the Steelers needed to have better security on their picks. Okay. Because people are after their guys. Okay. Which is hilarious on a lot of levels. However, however, I bring this up for a reason. There's no doubt in my mind that the Steelers did go into their first pick with, you know, a field of positions, not necessarily a position, you know, well, like we have to get, you know, a running back or a wide receiver. And then there's no way their pick wasn't affected in some form or other by a strange run on their positions, plural of preference. It wasn't just that, uh, the, you know, Clyde edwards Hilaire was gone. It's not just the 10 wide receivers were gone. Dale, even the safeties went. Like, there was there were back-to-back -back safeties early in that second round. It was almost comical at one point. Like, seriously, do you people know that the Steelers just need these three positions? Well, you know, I, when, when I was doing all my drafts, when this stuff all initially started, um, you know, you started looking at, okay, who's going to be available mm -hmm. at pick 49? And so you start – honing down on some guys and you know a couple of those guys were still available that that you know we'd all looked at uh the you know, two of the running backs um you know I I looked at Chase Claypool and I liked Chase Claypool I just didn't like him as much as I liked the two running backs because I thought they'd make a, a more immediate impact they feel differently uh they feel like he can be and make an impact I mean the guy had 29 tackles on special teams despite being a star player at Notre Dame, he, they had not, his freshman year at Notre Dame, they had 19 tackles on punt coverage, to, uh, and he had eight of them. Wow. Um, I mean, he's just a guy who's – he's a football player. And so he's going to make an impact this year. I'm going to go out on a limb and say he will be a fan favorite. And, I, I, you know, I know that the, everybody loves the guard as well, Dotson. Um, you know, they saw the video of him pulling the truck. Up a, up a slight grade. That'll do it. <laughs> and, you know, and I guarantee you that our friend uh, Craig Wolfley will have him as his camp phenom uh, mm -hmm. once we get back to training camp. That is a slam dunk a for slam Wolf. Dunk. Yep. I love him as a, as a big uh, hollywog mosher or whatever he wants to come, whatever word he makes up the column. Uh, uh, but, I mean, I thought they did okay. Uh, you, you, when you don't have the draft capital of some of the other teams, 
I mean, of course the Bengals had a great draft. They had the number one overall pick. Every round. Uh, every yeah. round. Yeah, every round, the, too. The Browns had a good draft. They had the 10th overall pick in the and draft. And the Ravens had 100 picks, too. Yeah. And, and, again, this is something – I always like to point this out, that you can't have it both ways. Everybody's really eager and free and easy to give up draft picks in hypothetical trades. Absolutely. Right up until they're watching the draft and the third round comes along and the Steelers don't have a pick and you're sitting there waiting 60 picks or whatever it is. Um, the drafts matter. They really do. I, I do think the teams around the Steelers got better than, than they did in this draft by virtue of what we just said. More picks, higher picks. The Steelers' hall was, was what it was. The Steelers did, of course, end up getting a running back, Anthony McFarland, out of Maryland, uh, speedster. And that's not going to be anything that placates people. The one thing I wonder about, though, is, is he going to help the Steelers out of the backfield by simple virtue of being different than the rest of them? Do you know what I mean? Because that was the one thing. I'm not going to compare him – to you know to, to J.K. Dobbins or to or Cam Akers or the guys that were taken ahead of him but at the same time those guys were going to be a little bit like Benny Snell or a little bit like James Conner uh, McFarland's not no he's he's a speed back and he's a little bit I, I see people calling him small um, he's basically the same size as J.K. Dobbins uh, nobody was calling J.K. Dobbins small. No, never heard Dobbins of Dobbins is 5'9 and 208 pounds. This guy's 5'8 and 207 pounds. They're the same size. I mean, you know. Yeah, give or take a cheeseburger at any given moment, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> He's fast. I mean, there's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I think that's one of the reasons why Dobbins fell in this draft. I mean, he ended up being the fifth running back taken. Is that no, We didn't have a time on him. Now, I thought he would go to the combine and run a 4'4'5 four, four, or something in that range. But then all the other Ohio State guys, who I thought were fast too, went to the combine and ran four sixes. Uh, you know, all their receivers. So I don't know if that hurt him or not. Uh, but, you know, I look at McFarland. Um, I, I like him. The only question I had with him, because they used a two-back offense, kind of like what, what happened uh, you know, with, in, at North Carolina State, uh, you know, when, when uh, Jalen Samuels was there, they never really uh, – there were some games here and there where they gave him the ball – uh, you know, 20 times in the game. So he like has the Ohio State like game. the Ohio State game. Watching, yeah. The Indiana game, mm -hmm. you know, right before that where he had, you know, over 500 yards or 450 yards of offense against two Big Ten teams. Um, but they didn't do that as much. They didn't do it really at all last year. And, you know, we find out he was uh, hit a high ankle sprain all season long. But, you know, you turn on the tape. I remember watching that Ohio State game because we were on the road somewhere. I can't remember where. And just watching, I'm like, so, you mean, uh, or you're telling me that Maryland's beating Ohio State? So I turned mm -hmm. the game on, and he's breaking off long runs all over the place. I'm like, wow. And they've got guys. Ohio State has, you know, probably 15 guys off of that defense that he was running around and through uh, got drafted in the last two drafts. Um, so he has talent. Um, he gives them something, a, a different dimension. That yeah. to get up your initial point that they didn't have. Kareth yeah. White was nice, and they used him in that role. But eventually teams catch on with like, hey, he's just going to run sweeps and end the routes. He was still – he still had success doing that. This guy's a little more dynamic than that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Kareth White was uh, the same thing that Jalen Samuels is when he comes onto the field. You know exactly what kind of play is coming. Um, and and that, that's one of the things that, I, that I've taken to, to looking at here after this draft, in particular as it relates to the 2020 Steelers. Uh, Connor is going to be the guy – I mean, he's just going to be James Conner, presuming he stays on the field. And actually, if he doesn't stay on the field, he's going to be James Conner. <laughs> uh, Benny Snell is going to be exactly what we saw. He's, gonna, he's not as one-dimensional as he sometimes gets painted, I think. He's, he's able to, to get around and and make some nice runs, as we saw whenever he was uh, given the ball late last season. Uh, but this is a different threat. And you mentioned having a couple backs. You know, I, I know it's not 1975, but if you gave defenses a different look, not necessarily a you know standard wishbone or whatever, but you you give you you let them uh, at least guess a little bit who's going to get the ball, which which way are they going to run? Can they beat us on the edge? Can we seal the edge? Uh, that makes the Steelers' offense uh, a different challenge for them to prepare for. 
Yeah, they're definitely going to be that. And, and you can throw a bunch of different packages out there. I, I kind of detailed that in my, in my 10 thoughts today. What do you do if you're a de defense and the Steelers come out with, with Juju as, as your smallest skill position player on the field? Or, or if you decide to put, uh, you know, McFarland in the backfield, and you've got Claypool and Juju on the edge with, with uh, you know, uh, two, uh, two tight ends or one tight end. I mean, there's all kinds of different things here that, that if the defense goes with a big package because there's a bunch of big guys on the field, and then all of a sudden you have this guy in the backfield. And just squirting through them. Yeah. yeah he's going to be the <laughs> fastest guy on the field. Yeah. And, you know, I, there's some different things that they can do there. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, Randy Feekner is, is looking at that right now, think, you know, coming up with some different ways to, to make that happen. Uh, normally, we'd all be gearing up for a rookie mini camp, uh, if not, you know, press conferences and everything else that would be going on on the South Side. Um, and yet, when you heard Kevin Colbert and Mike Tomlin talk over the weekend, they have no idea. I mean, it, it, we don't know what's going to happen with NFL offseason workouts. They can talk about uh, video conditioning and stuff like that. Uh, but until those guys are here and you know, your eyes are on them. There isn't going to be any off-season workouts, is there? Yeah, and that's going to be the tough part. And I, I spoke with uh, with Art Rooney the second yesterday, and he he essentially said, he really said that you know, until the entire league is opened up, until all the states that have a team uh, in them are are open, the NFL is not going to allow the other teams to go and open up their facilities because they want to keep everybody on on an even footing. And I understand that that's, that's, you know, fair is fair. Uh, we've seen the NBA say, Hey, the States that are opened up, the teams can go work out again. Well, you're the other teams and you're going, wait a second, what about us? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, apparently the NBA's thought process is uh, if we open up, you know, X number of facilities or whatever, if you want to go use them, go use them. It doesn't right. matter where you are right now. Football. Let's be honest, guys are going out and working out anyways. You see all these yeah. videos people are posting. They're they're on the field together. They're you know they're doing these things. They're in gyms. But football's so. different. Football, uh, you know, the controlled settings that's that are involved, and particularly with rookie camp, which is uh, or or any of the the off season workouts, whether it's OTAs or whatever, are really 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 structured. And from a team standpoint, guys aren't just going out there doing jumping jacks. I mean, <laughs> there's it's it's eleven on eleven. It's seven on seven. There, there's actual football team drills going on. That's the thing, you know, these rookie orientations, these rookie mini camps, they basically run these guys through practice drills mm -hmm. that they're going to be doing for the next eight months. Right. So, you know, if they don't do these things on the field, those first couple of days of training camp, when, when they actually start to have them are going to be a mess, yes. just a complete mess. Okay. Here's, yeah. here's how we line up. This is what we do. This is how we run this drill, all that stuff that should be done already. So again, I go back to, to, to my thought process on these teams that are expecting rookies to come in and play right away. You telling me Joe Burrow's going to be ready to start for the Bengals in week one when he's had 20 NFL practices. He's the quarterback. That's yeah. kind of a big deal. Rookie quarterback under, under the most Optimal circumstances, never mind not having, you know, really an offensive line. The most optimal circumstances coming in. Is He'll be meeting A.J. Nightmare. Green for the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Hi, I'm Joe. I'm A.J. Oh, this over here is Tyler. All right, let's go. You know? <laughs> it's just going to be a mess. But yeah. uh, they're going to do it, and they're not going to open up until everybody can, can do this because – they don't have to right now. That's the, you know, the beauty of this. They don't have to do anything really until late July. And by then, I think we're going to be, I think we're going to be pretty much open across the country. Yeah. The one thing I wonder about uh, with, with the New York Times report about this, about the Spanish soccer league, La Liga, and their plan as they come out. And I really, I, I read it and I attached a lot of it in my head to the National Football League as, as their training sessions open early on they're they're going to do it in clusters of like six players over here five players over here they don't even get together in the same cafeteria or whatever for the first part whenever it's not essential for everybody to be out on the pitch together and i'm wondering if something like that that actually would apply better to american football than it would to international football you know because you have your positional guys over you know how that these drills are anyway all the linebackers so, are over here the tight ends yeah, are over I mean, here they, they kind of do that already at, at training camp because mm -hmm. they're able to spread out at right. college like they can't do it you know on their own facility uh, but some of these teams aren't going to have that option because they work out at their at their team facility 
uh, that's one of the, the advantages of, of taking these guys out to, to St. Vincent College is that, A, you're sequestered. And you can tell these guys, hey, we're not, you know, you can't leave camp for the first, you know, whatever. Or, may, you know, you're here. We want you on campus. You have to stay on campus. And they can shut that thing down if they want. I like would think so, it. yeah. Um, and you could test them all as they come in. And, okay, nobody's, nobody's showing any uh, – nobody has any symptoms. Nobody has any – uh, nobody's sick. If somebody is sick, you immediately yank them out of, out of practice. And, you know, there's going to be an instance where probably somebody tests positive at somebody's training camp. And, and that, that's. Well, I, again, that's where this Spanish model comes into play. They, their, their testing system is that the, the, the athlete or whoever, they don't get out of the car, Dale. They pull into the parking lot, and they're tested right there. Then they pull over, and they wait the two, three minutes it takes for the test. Then they're allowed in. So you, you never even have a chance to infect the place. I just want to know what's going to happen with us. I know. <laughs> but we talk about it like nobody cares about the reporters, right? Because we could spend the next half hour on that. Like, what are they going to do with us? You know, I don't want something stuck up my nose every time I go write a column. But uh, that's probably where this is headed. They're going to tell us we can't leave campus. Like That's right. <laughs> Thank you.